decide which solar installations to support, what size makes sense, uh, personal, residential, community scale, large commercial, what ownership and financing models make sense, homeowner, building owner, municipal ownership, local solar installer ownership, national company ownership. And the final question is, why does it matter who owns the solar installations? Uh, the first panelist is Mark Hensley. Uh, he's a co-op power consultant. He has 16 years of business development experience in renewable and solar energy. For the last four and a half years, he has been working as the director of business development with First Solar on large utility scale photovoltaic projects ranging from 10 million megawatts to over 550 megawatts, half a billion watts, primarily in the desert southwest. Actually, maybe not all photovoltaic, right? They're they're all PV. They're all PV. Okay. A graduate of the University of Massachusetts, he lives in Florence with his wife and two daughters. He is currently helping Co-op Power on an informal basis to analyze options for developing a community solar program. So please welcome uh, Mark Hensley.
But solar is also great for residential and community solar and, and uh, commercial scale solar. And there, the projects are smaller, the capital requirements are lower, and there's a lot more options for how you can uh, finance and own the solar system. So I think the better question is, what, what, is the, what is the best ownership option for your project? And you know, when, you, when you're analyzing that, you know, there's a lot of things to look at. I think you know, I'd start with what are your motivations? Are they purely financial? Are they ideological? Um, do you own a viable solar property? So I bought a great little house in downtown Florence where I can walk to everything, but I can't build a solar system on my property. There's just too many trees, too small, facing the wrong way. So how can I own solar? It's got to be a way for me to own solar. Uh, project size drives how much capital is needed, drives what type of investors can bring that money to the table. Uh, your risk appetite. So I think there are risks involved in owning solar systems. Um, and it's important to understand those risks. And some people might not want to take on those risks, in which case maybe it's best they don't own solar directly. They own it somehow directly. And then also, what's your ability to, to maintain these uh, systems over the long term? So the, these are assets that deliver value for 30 years, and uh, but they, they, they do need maintenance. They're going to need to be maintained for that period of time. So uh, I put down two basic ownership models, and Todd, in, in our pre-panel uh, conversation, you corrected me and, and pointed out a third uh, ownership model. But uh, I think <clears throat> there's a lot of different um, flavors of these two models that are, that are out there. But there's basically two ways you can own solar, um, aside from Todd's, <laughs> which is, uh, so you can have a self-ownership model where someone just goes out, buys a solar system with uh, cash or uh, equity and debt, and puts it on their roof, say, and, uh, and just owns everything about that system. So they own all the risks and they own all the rewards uh, with that system. So that, that's one way to do it. Uh, the other way is through a power purchase agreement. I heard some companies uh, represent here in the room that offer those types of agreements. Uh, so here, here's a, uh, a model where the host or the project developer doesn't own the system. Uh, a third party owns the system and sells the energy to um, the host of that that system via a, a long-term power purchase agreement or, or a PPA. And so those are really the two principal ways that, that solar is owned today in the market. I think the third that Todd mentioned was you don't own it at all, right? You buy a green energy product from an energy service provider. So someone's owning that system out there, you're buying green energy, you're helping to support that system in sort of a more virtual way, but in, but in a very real way, you're buying the energy off that system. So there's a lot of different uh, flavors, and there's not enough time to go into all of them, and we can, we can maybe do that throughout uh, the working sessions or some of the other panels here, probably mentioning some of so the details about that. So I, I like to, to remind people that there are, you know, what, what are the risks and rewards in, in owning a uh, solar system? So everyone should know that there's, there's revenue upside and downside potential. And I'm focusing right here on financial risk and reward. I realize there may be other ideological rewards uh, to the system. But. So but just from a financial point of view, um, and, and from a Massachusetts specific point of view, um, there's some, some risks and rewards that you should, you should understand. So in Massachusetts, a big chunk of the value of owning a solar system today, and really what's driving installations today, is the value of the solar renewable energy credits, um, or the SREX, that you can sell uh, here in Massachusetts. And <clears throat> I've only been really looking at Massachusetts for a couple of a couple of months now. I've been coming out of the southwest world, the, the desert southwest world. And I can't really find a way to project long term what the uh, long term value of those SREX is going to be. And so, uh, uh, maybe someone knows the answer to that. I haven't found that person yet. Uh, so they, they're going to have value, and um, the question is how much. And uh, I think any purchaser of a, of a system should really dig into that question and get comfortable with the risk they're taking um, and the potential reward they could get from, uh, from assuming that, that, that risk. Uh, so I think that in Massachusetts, to me, that's kind of a, that should be the center of attention. 
Um, a lot of people buy systems because they, uh, uh, they, they want to offset their utility purchases. And so the value of the system is, is, is derived partly by how much, how much the utility rates are. Um, and so utility rates probably are always going to go up, but at, at what rate? Um, so you take some risk there as to what the future rates uh, of electricity is going to be. Um, and then there's some performance risks, right? So, um, uh, you know, these systems do go down, inverters break, they have to be repaired. Uh, you lose production time, the, the PV modules do degrade, how fast do they degrade, there's some, risk, there's some technology risk there. Uh, I think it's all very low, by the way, but it's, it's there and you should be aware of it. Uh, so there's things like that to think about. And then there's also sort of energy prediction risk, right? So everyone says, well, it's going to produce this much because we get this much sunlight. And <clears throat> at least on big systems, this is a very big question because uh, the amount of sunlight you can receive vary 5 to 10% in a given year, maybe 3 to 5% long-term average. Um, and so your, your financial return is going to be affected by that. It could be more, it could be less. Um, so those are some of the sort of revenue upside, downside uh, things to think about. Uh, and then there's also operating costs that you should think about. So um, uh, inverter repair and replacement is probably the, the biggest one you have to worry about. You can Catch that with warranties, but something to think about. <coughs> Next slide. So, what ownership financing models make sense? Uh, this is for co-op power. So, uh, for the residential side, I think you know direct ownership is always the simplest if, if the owner can afford to buy them. And um, Sarah's going to talk about her company's product, which is a, I think a long product. Um, for homeowners that allows them to facil facilitate direct ownership by, by homeowners and my partner, so I'm sorry I'm spelling companies now, sold the age instead of sold the age. But, uh, you know, so I think, I think that's the simplest, but a PPA model can certainly work for homeowners who don't have the cash um, or, or who don't want to take all those risks that um, I just mentioned, right? So if a homeowner signs a PPA agreement, they're not taking all that revenue risk, right? person who owns that system and is selling the energy is taking all of that revenue risk. They're going to, the homeowner in that case is just going to buy what the system produces at, at a pre-agreed price. If it produces more, it produces less, you know, it really doesn't matter to the homeowner. Uh, on the commercial side, uh, direct purchase is always easiest. Um, you know, the, the big thing on the commercial side is does the customer have the tax appetite to, to fully utilize the, uh, the tax benefits that are available today from, from the federal government. So, <clears throat> at least in the commercial world, you've got uh, the investment tax credit, which is 30% of the capital cost of the project, so it can be paid for through the investment tax credit. And roughly another 20% of the capital cost of that system can be uh, paid for, in a sense, through the um, through the accelerated depreciation benefits that are available to private companies. So that's 50% of the system's value that can be sort of bought down with those tax benefits. But not everyone has a big tax bill and can, can't um, take advantage of those, those benefits. So in that, in that case, there are companies, again, PPA providers that will buy the system that have that appetite for those tax benefits and can, um, can sort of deliver a lower price, assuming they don't take all of the upside for themselves, they should be able to deliver a, a lower price for the, for the energy through the yeah. um, Community solar, um, you know, the real challenge I think for community solar really comes back to finding uh, a vehicle that can utilize those uh, investment tax credit and the, and the depreciation benefits. So when I think of community solar, if you're driving simply for the lowest cost, which may not always be the driver for, for, for community solar. Um, it seems obvious to me that you're going to have to bring in outside investors that can utilize those tax benefits. And so who are those investors, I think, maybe becomes the question in, in community solar. And, uh, you know, you could, you, could, you could find those types of tax benefits in the large, the large banks. If your project is big enough, they probably don't want to do some projects. But I think
think the challenge in the context of this uh, uh, conference here is how can we get local investors with the tax appetite to invest in these projects and, uh, and help bring the cost down for uh, I just throw in some other things here. Uh, down here. I don't know what crowdsourcing might do to, to solar uh, ownership models. You know, there may be some interesting things that come out of that. I haven't, haven't really thought about it. Is there some other cooperative model that we could develop? Um, I haven't found it yet. I always come back to this. You really need a tax equity investor uh, to, to come to the table. So that's all I had. I think I had 10 minutes and hopefully stay pretty close to that. Uh, it doesn't answer all the questions, but hopefully gives some kind of a framework for, uh, for talking about this in great detail. So thank you. Solar. 
Uh, and how we would uh, acquire that is through purchasing uh, the net metering energy credit. So if someone builds a large solar facility uh, and there's no load on that, so if you're building it in a field uh, and you're not building it on a building, but if you're building it in a the field, there's no load needed on that particular ground, you have to sell your Schedule Z or your net metering energy credits to someone. Uh, and we see ourselves as a purchaser of net metering energy credits. So if you're building something uh, on a field, you sell us the net metering energy credits, we in turn sell them uh, to one of our municipal or government-based customers. So our, we see our entire load in the future being local green energy. All those profits, or any profits uh, that we make, which is not a guarantee, I can assure you, uh, would then be reinvested uh, into uh, our other programs and services uh, around solar. So we're also a solar renewable energy credit aggregator broker. So if you put solar on your house uh, and you want to sell your renewable energy credits, we act as an SREC broker. So for a very small fee, uh, we will bring your uh, SRECs to market, sell them at the highest price we can. Then again, any revenue that we make uh, off of that is reinvested in additional programs and services. We are also operating and putting together the largest electricity aggregation in the Commonwealth. Right now we have over 100,000 people, 28 communities signed up for the electricity aggregation. What is the electricity aggregation? That's where uh, a town meeting uh, votes uh, to become part of a large aggregation. We then take all that electricity load from everyone uh, in that area that's on the default service. So if you don't have a competitive supplier already signed up to be your electricity supplier, you're on the default service. You're automatically included in the aggregation. We take that entire load and put it up to bid. So now, all of a sudden, instead of the buying power of one, you have the buying power of 100,000 people. And we're looking for locally sourced, as green as possible, cheap electricity. We're also hoping to have, as part of that, what we're going to be calling Hampshire Green, which is going to be the green energy uh, option that uh, customers of National Grid can now purchase, but Wamiko customers can't. Uh, and we hope to have offer the Hampshire Green, and for an additional uh, fee, you can buy green energy. Now, usually that just means that you're buying SREX for ancient main hydro or wind somewhere in Texas or something that you're never going to see. But we plan on having a green energy, uh, Hampshire Green Fund, that takes all the proceeds that are made from that and reinvests it locally. Uh, into green energy uh, products and services so that you're actually going to see uh, where the additional money that you're spending on green energy is going. Because right now when you buy that service, for the most part, uh, that money is, is flowing uh, out of the state and out of the, out of the area. We're also working uh, on putting together a solar lease option. Sarah's going to be talking about kind of the purest model of uh, solar ownership, uh, but we're, we are putting together a solar lease option uh, but the reason why ours is different is because it's all local, and again, it's through a, essentially a nonprofit entity. Um, and so any revenue generated through the solar lease option that we'll be putting together, all that revenue will be reinvested in additional programs and services, creating a true, sustainable, local energy grid uh, for the area. We also put out a solar RFP for over 115 municipal sites uh, throughout uh, Western Massachusetts. So 115 sites owned by cities and towns, put out an RFP and we're trying to uh, secure a vendor for those cities and towns for a, a, as local as possible uh, solar company to build solar uh, on those 115 sites. Total value of that's probably about half a billion dollars uh, if it actually all gets built out, which it won't. Uh, but it's a very interesting uh, part of it, including municipalities, school districts uh, in the uh, solar project. All of this kind of comprehensive picture around solar and electricity I think is very important especially in kind of a nonprofit driven uh, uh, organization such as ours, uh, where we are all supporting each other. We're supporting the co-ops and the local organizations, Pioneer Valley Local First and the other local organizations, keeping all of that money locally and reinvesting it locally in a revolving type of basis. It, it, it's important because we in the United States have given up the solar panel uh, manufacturing business for the most part to China uh, because we didn't have the appetite to, to subsidize our solar industry. Uh, and I do not think that Hampshire County should be giving up uh, the solar business altogether uh, to outside firms that, that are based principally in Wall Street and also in Silicon Valley in California. We should be incorporating all of our brain power to create a variety of services to keep all of the solar revenue uh, local and make sure that the solar revenue that is generated is reinvested in the community to create additional uh, solar projects and additional alternative energy projects. So. That was a lot of information, so hopefully uh, we'll have some time to uh, sit and answer some of your questions. Uh, 
Uh, and I thank you for your time.
I play this game of how much am I producing versus how much am I using at every given time of the day, right? So before I go and start my dishwasher, I see, oh, am I producing more than I'm using right now, right? And I time is what I match that up. So I am incredibly engaged as a consumer of energy. Um, I get an estric check every quarter, and that reinforces in my mind as a consumer that this is good investment that I make, right? It's like my solar dividend check. This is a really powerful thing if we're thinking about changing consumers' minds and engaging in energy, and particularly seeing the value of solar. Uh, so local ownership, I think, is a great thing for the environment, for the local economy, for my pocketbook, and for my education as a consumer of energy. So the, the picture that I just painted there is the case um, in a decreasing number of installations here in Massachusetts. So these days, only about 25% of the solar installed on residential rooftops looks like what I just described. 75% of it is installed using a leasing or PVA model, where someone else makes the investment, someone else gets those returns. And so a lot of what I just described, and yes, there's room to change this perhaps, but a lot of what I just described doesn't exist in those cases. 75% solar now on rooftops is installed in, in that fashion. Um, so why is this the case? I like to talk about the three phases of solar. So before solar made good financial sense, when panels were still very expensive, uh, solar was simply equipment that solved a need. Right? So you want to live off the grid, you want to reduce your carbon footprint, um, and you were buying expensive equipment to meet that need. Right? Solar got cheaper, and it now makes good financial sense. So in about the mid-2000s, uh, savvy institutional investors figure this out, right? We can get a good return from solar. And they created a business model, which delivered attractive returns to investors, and sold solar to homeowners as some savings in their utility bill. Right, so that's where we are right now, the kind of sun-run solar cities of the world. This is their business model. Uh, so what's wrong with this business model? It offers homeowner, so, homeowner solar and no money down. It offers immediate savings on the utility bill. It's gotten systems on thousands of rooftops. It's made solar accessible, so why don't we just stop here? Like, why isn't that good enough, right? So. There are several reasons I would suggest, and I'm happy to talk about this more. One is the distribution of wealth argument, right? So if you think of solar as creating a pie of wealth, uh, it can get carved up in many ways. And right now, the leasing PPA model, um, the lion's share is being captured by investors, largely out-of-state investors and their toxic investors, and uh, very little of it is going to consumers going to you, the person who actually owns the roof. Like at the end of the day, this is your roof, right? So this is your pie uh, to share or not share how you see fit, right? Um, so the one is the distribution argument. The second is the kind of local versus out of state argument. Uh, our state is forfeiting a massive amount of value with each solar installation that is installed on roofs that is not owned by our Commonwealth residents. So if we keep going the way we are going, the next 100 megawatts of residential solar that we will install, we will forfeit over $100 million purely in the federal tax credits alone. Like that is money that could have been recycled in our communities and it will be captured by tax free investors in New York, in Silicon Valley, some of the places mentioned earlier, right? So this is ours to lose <coughs> and like we're headed in that direction right now. The, the third reason why I'm not satisfied with the PPA lease model is this kind of engagement education uh, part of the story that I alluded to before. Um, we are missing an opportunity to engage consumers when we settle for a PPA lease model because done poorly, <laughs> it, it is one that um, invites consumers to close their eyes and sign the dotted line. These people are, are trying to rent a roof and uh, they, they're asking you to put no money down, and so you really, if you want to as a consumer, you can close your eyes 
and sign the dotted line and move on, right? You don't have to work too hard because they're not asking anything of you, right? For some consumers, like, this is a great option, and I'm not arguing that, that direct ownership is for everyone. I guess I'm, I'm arguing for giving consumers choice, and I think for consumers that are primed to be engaged, it's a lost opportunity for us not to engage them. Uh, the, the fourth reason to, that I'm not satisfied with the existing business models is a quality one. So the incentives in a leasing model are to install a cookie cutter system as many times as they can and to not worry about quality. Because the lion's share of the federal supports for these projects are not performance based, right? It's 30% of the cost of the system they get, they collect as a federal tax credit. So that means if I install solar panels behind a chimney and it's going to be shaded, it really doesn't matter to me if I'm a solar leasing company. Um, so I think we get higher quality when we install using local installers who have their reputation at stake and are building systems for your benefit as, as a consumer. Uh, and the last point is a, is a grow the category point. So there are many homeowners who are unwilling to let a third party own something on their roof. And we are not providing products and services to support those homeowners. So um, just simply in, in the name of growing the pie, we need to give other options for people to finance, other, other options for people to overcome the upfront cost that don't involve forfeiting them. So at, at some age we talk a lot about what I call the third phase of solar. And that is uh, selling solar as a good consumer investment. And what does that mean? If you think about, you know, you have your retirement plan, you have your health insurance plan, and now you have your energy plan. And that protects your family and that insulates you from, from risks in the world. Uh, you know, what does that look like? What kind of products and services do we need to bring to the market? <laughs> don't exist right now to support solar as a good consumer investment. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, we're going to have some time for, for questions. i just like to lay down a, a little bit of a, some guidelines. Right after this, there's going to be a group discussion. So I'd like to, if we can, maybe keep the questions to, to mostly clarifying uh, rather than trying to present your own ideas. Uh, so just asking the, the panelists to clarify things they said that you have questions about. Uh, and then you'll have an opportunity to, to give your own input in, in the period that we have coming up after this. Um, and the other thing I'd like to ask you to is to try to distribute your questions among all three panelists and not end up focusing on any one thing. Uh, I think we'll, we'll all get more out of it if we can do that. So, are there any questions? Yes. Yeah.
Um, so if, if uh, I think, yeah, if, if, if renewable energy subsidies disappear tomorrow, you know, solar is going to go back to being um, a, a largely an off-grid uh, type of um, technology where the cost of generation are very high, and you can you can make a case for, for solar by itself. And you know, when at, at first solar. Um, you know, just on an encouraging note, I mean, I think the cost of conventional fossil nuclear generation are, are continuing to go up. Um, and solar and renewables are coming down. Solar has come down dramatically, um, you know, frighteningly fast, right? Especially if you're manufacturing solar. Uh, but when, when First Solar, for instance, is looking at the globe and where, uh, and is wrestling with that exact question, so they're now targeting um, areas of the world where uh, solar does compete today, head-to-head, -head, subsidy free with conventional generation, right? And so those are places like the Middle East, um, parts of Australia, India, um, you know, and so those, those places are starting to emerge in the world, and I think you're going to see more and more places where solar, for instance, makes sense uh, without subsidies. Uh, and I, I think it's also interesting to see in, in California, um, you know, the, the energy prices that are now being quoted from solar, granted we've got subsidies, but they're starting now to match or be very close to gas fire generation in, in, uh, in California. Right? So we still have the subsidies, but five years ago we were two, three times the price of, of gas. Today we're sitting right on top of gas. I mean, I guess the only thing I would add is that, you know, not all subsidies are the same. And so thinking about which subsidy we want to fight hard for and which we should say goodbye to. And I would, I'm would, i looking forward to the 2016 when the tax equity support of this industry goes away because it's really created a, uh, a dysfunctional financing of these assets and one that favors large, large investors in this space. Um, you know, as a state, we are moving away from non-production-based incentives like the rebate and moving towards things like s -tracks. and I think that's a much more healthy, functional form of subsidy, uh, subsidy, if you will. But there, there are certainly big players in the space who talk about, you know, let's have a conversation, like, should we all give up our subsidy if they'll give up theirs too, right? Like, this is Jigger Shaw's big thing, like, as a solar industry, like, let's squeeze our costs as much as we can right now squeeze those balance of systems costs so we can have that conversation with a straight face and say, yeah, we're ready to give it up. Cool, you go first. We're right there with you. Right. Okay. And, and I, um, yeah, and until we get our heads around this fracking situation with the natural gas as well, the, 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 I mean, that's absolutely dominating uh, the electricity market right now. So uh, until that, until we stop that or, or find some ways to internalize the, the massive externalities that are that are coming from uh, the fracking industry then uh, you know we, we do need some sort of uh, call, call it a subsidy if you will some sort of support structure uh, for alternative energy generation and, and again as Sarah mentioned that the downside of the subsidies is that there's a lot of snake oil salesmen out there which is uh, why the consumer uh, needs to be very uh, leery of offers that sound too good to be true because they are uh, and uh, someone's either putting together a bunch of contracts to try to sell to someone else, and we saw a lot of our towns get approached by a snake oil salesman that yeah. had no intention of ever building the system that they promised, no intention of ever uh, fulfilling the promises that they put into a contract, and those contracts were broken, the town's left uh, with an empty piece of paper, uh, and now a year behind schedule, two years <coughs> behind schedule. From, from so the subsidies do have a, a dark side to them, uh, and people need to be educated to them. I have a quick question. Um, Turner's Falls is now using something solarized Massachusetts. So, can you talk a little bit about solarized Massachusetts? Anybody who can? Well, yeah, because uh, we actually uh, partnered uh, with uh, Northeast Solar and uh, we are going to be Montague's uh, escrow broker. Uh, as part of that. So Solarize uh, Massachusetts is an effort uh, of the Mass Clean Energy Center uh, and any green community uh, is uh, allowed to uh, apply uh, to be part of the Solarize Mass program. Hatfield uh, was uh, the first town in, uh, in Hampshire County to be uh, part of the Solarize Mass. We actually did on that program as well uh, with Northeast Solar, which is a Hatfield-based company. 
and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts gave it to a Delaware-based firm. Uh, so you, you see uh, that the Commonwealth itself uh, needs to look at uh, the incentives, quote unquote, that they use just by awarding projects and bids uh, and make sure that uh, the benefits of solar installation as subsidized by the Mass CEC stays in the Commonwealth and ideally stays in the local region uh, that uh, uh, they are awarding the bid for. But uh, Solarized Mass um, basically uh, guarantees uh, the state uh, tax credits uh, to the installations and also provides a tiered pricing structure so that the more panels that are uh, sold in that community, the cheaper uh, the installation becomes. Uh, you have to have a leasing model uh, which uh, we are a part of as well. So the Hampshire Council of Governments is deeply involved in the uh, Solaris Montague uh, project, uh, both with the leasing model and with the uh, SREC uh, brokering uh, program. And the uh, installer is the Hatfield-based uh, company uh, called Northeast Solar. So you're, you're getting a, a great deal uh, for the, the Terms Falls project because that is uh, basically all as local as you can get. Uh, there. Some of the other uh, awardees, uh, we're not as uh, locally focused, uh, Mass CC does distribute uh, the awards quite a bit, um, and I don't have a breakdown of exactly who got what, but, uh, they, but, the, you should, but the state is playing a very strong role uh, in awarding uh, who gets these projects, and they are, they are significant, there's some, uh, some good value there. Uh, yes, hi. This is really picking up on one of the things that Sarah said, uh, which I heard early on, but I didn't hear her summarize it, which I think is the education. Like when she mentioned she, you know, would look to see before she turned her dishwasher on, did she have a, a build? And that I would like to see more emphasis about paying attention to how much energy we use. And I wish that would be built in to all of these alternative, and particularly solar uh, uh, projects. I, I think that is so important that that's gotta go hand in glove, but the alternative is conservation and changing our appetite for it and our lifestyle. And for instance, this room that I am freezing in, and I just think that, you know, this is a, blooming waste and, uh, and... And the door's open. And the door's open. <laughs> it, it is just, you know, that just offends <laughs> me. That it just is crazy. So I think we, and as consumers, when we go into places that are freezing cold, like supermarkets or whatever, we should speak up. We should say something. I mean, anyway. But I, I do think, Sarah, I love that because that really makes us conscious of the fact that we're turning on the light, we're you know, using, God forbid, the dryer, we you know, free solar power, um, you know, all that kind of thing, and, and that's, we gotta click on. Yeah, no, actually, the consumer engagement piece is huge. Um, so a lot of people argue about kind of, you know, should you do energy efficiency first, and then renewable energy, you know, demand side management first, and then, um, and there's certainly an argument for that. Uh, but I think if you're a psychologist, your a different argument will resonate with you, and that's the one that I've kind of seen my, myself firsthand, and that is solar is the gateway drug to energy efficiency. <laughs> so solar is that bling that gets people excited, right? There's a real difference in the $100 check that comes for your SREX, or in my case, a $1,200 check every quarter that I get for SREX versus $1,200 of savings, right? There's just a real difference. Not if you're an accountant, not if you look at a balance sheet, but a psychological difference. So we have an opportunity right now to engage consumers with this bling, with this gateway drug. <laughs> and we need to do it as much as possible. So, you know, one of the things that, um, that we're working on at Sunnygate is a lot of consumer-facing decision support tools. So we've built a tool which shows consumers what their, uh, what a solar purchase for their house looks like. What if SREX go away, does it still look okay? What if inflation energy is 0%, not 5%? What does it look like then? Um, and really, in, you know, allow them to play and see for themselves what this makes sense for them. That's like the first engagement of the consumer, right? It's not just the paper proposal, which has a number baked into it for inflation energy, but an engagement tool, right? And the second piece that we're building is, is a dashboard. So now you're a current customer of Sungage, 
And now you can go online anytime and see, you know, where's your energy production? What's your return on investment been so far, you know, since you bought this thing? What did you sell your last SREX for? Where are you in your loan? Um, so think like kind of a dashboard for, you know, your E-Trade, your Vanguard account, something like that, right? So that it's at your fingertips because owners of solar are now, you know, we can leverage that population of, of kind of converts um, to our benefit, right? So I gave a talk to Eric Carl back in February and in preparation for that talk, I actually went myself and added up how much money my solar array had, had earned our family. Like, I'm in the business, right? I don't know this number. So I went and did this for myself. It was $44,000 after 18 months, right? That floored me, right? Like, I didn't even know that number for myself. So uh, that really changes how, as consumers, we feel about this investment when we have the tools that remind us, like, here's how you're doing. Like, when that neighbor asks you, like, so, Sarah, how's that floor working out? Like, I have information at my fingertips. 